Hello, game theorists. Today we are still in chapter 7. So in the first couple of episodes, we looked at 2x2 two two games with mixed strategies. Then we looked at some more complicated games, but then we found that we could sometimes simplify by eliminating a dominated strategy. Sometimes a mixed strategy it dominates a pure strategy and get rid of that dominated strategy. So that can make it as more complicated and big can make it shrink down a two by two game, which we already know how to handle. Sometimes, however, you can't eliminate any strategies and you just have to dive right into the complexity and handle those three by three games or bigger. So now we'll learn how to do that. So our 3x3 three three game is one that you are very likely familiar with, rock, paper, scissors. So when you're a kid, you probably figured out pretty fast that the optimal way to play was you play rock a third of the time, play paper a third of the time, and play scissors a third of the time. Turns out your intuition was correct. We're going to prove it, and in so doing, give you some tools you need to analyze more complicated games. So if you play rock and your opponent also plays rock, it's a tie, so I'll call that zero, zero. Rock loses to paper, so that's a minus one. And if side that plays paper wins, that's a plus one. Rock beats scissors. Paper beats rock. Paper loses to scissors. Scissors lose to rock. And scissors beat paper. So our players, um, let's have Tim as our row player and Yusuf as our column player. So here's how we handle these more complicated games. So let's start by looking at things from Timothy's perspective. When he randomizes, he'll play rock with probability R1. He'll play paper, I also say R. Just to keep things simpler. There's no need to put a one in there. I'll play rock with probability R, and I'll play paper with probability P. That means they play scissors with probability one minus R minus P. Um, actually, you know, I do just say R one P one because I also have to specify. Yusuf's probabilities. So let's say Yusuf plays R with probability R2. Yusuf plays paper with probability P2. That means Yusuf plays scissors with probability 1 minus R2 minus P2. So here is the key idea to analyzing these games. The probabilities are continuous. R1 could be anywhere from 0 to 1, same for P1 and the other probabilities. We already know how to handle games with continuous strategies. We learned about that back in chapter 1. Sorry, chapter 5. So you got to write down each player's expected payoffs. And then what you do is you take partial derivatives, set them equal to zero, to find when are those expected payoffs maximized. Let's start with Tim. Tim. 
So one possibility is that Timothy plays rock and Yusuf also plays rock. In that case, Timothy gets zero. The probability of them both playing rock is the probability that Timothy plays rock, R1, and Yusuf plays rock at the same time, R2. So R1 times R2 is the probability of getting that. Now I could also end up over here with this randomization. So Timothy could get minus one, and that happens if Timothy plays rock and Yusuf plays paper. The probability that happens could be R1, probably of rock, times P2. Probably Yusuf plays paper. All right, let's move on to the next part of the table. It's also possible that Timothy wins by playing rock while Yusuf plays scissors. In that case, Timothy's payoff is one. The probability of that happening is if Timothy plays rock, probability R1, times probability that Yusuf plays scissors. All right, so we got that first row down, but there's more to our story. Timothy's not always playing rock. He's randomizing. Sometimes Timothy plays paper. And when Timothy plays paper, sometimes he wins because Yusuf plays rock. So if Timothy wins, he gets a payoff of positive one. The chance of that happening is P1, probably a Timothy playing paper, and R2, probably that Yusuf plays rock. Moving on, there could also be a tie if both of them play paper. So they both play paper, Timothy gets zero. The probability they both play paper is the probability that Tim plays paper, P1, times probability that Yusuf plays paper, P2. Next possibility. So Timothy might end up playing paper when he randomizes. Yusuf might play scissors when he's randomizing. Scissors beat paper, so Timothy gets minus one in that case. How likely is that? Well, it's the probability that Timothy plays paper, P1, times probability that Yusuf plays scissors. One minus R2 minus P2. All right, we have one more row to care about. Sometimes when Timothy randomizes, that randomization leads him to play scissors. That will occasionally lose to rock when Yusuf plays rock. So in that case, Timothy gets minus one. The probability of that happening is the probability that Timothy plays scissors, one minus R1 minus P1 and Yusuf plays rock, R2. Now, sometimes when Timothy plays scissors, he wins, because scissors cut paper. So Timothy's payoff is one in that case from winning. Probability of playing scissors is R1 minus P1. Probability of Yusuf playing paper is P2.
Lastly, there could be a tie if they both play scissors. So payoff is zero in that case for Timothy. And you have one minus R minus P1. Probably that Timothy plays scissors. Multiplied by probability that Yusuf plays scissors. One minus R2 minus P2. I'm not sure why I'm writing it all out because the zero is going to cancel everything anyways. I guess I'm just trying to be complete here. So we got step one taken care of. We found Timothy's expected payoff. Next up is to take derivatives. Before I do that though, I'm going to try to clean things up a little bit and simplify. Let's see how these zeros are just going to lead to some cancellation. So if I just cancel those guys, it'll look a little bit less intimidating. So Timothy's expected path is we get a minus R1 P2. We have an R1 times 1 minus R2 minus P2. And we have this P1 R2. That canceled because that's a zero. From minus P1 times 1 minus R2 minus P2. We've got a minus, minus R2, just moving stuff around, times 1 minus R1 minus P1. We have a plus P2. And this was a zero, so I just canceled out. So we've done some simplification. Um, so next step is just take partial derivatives. So it's very important to know your calculus here. If you need a refresher, um, go ahead and spend some time on that because this will be a pretty big deal. So the variables that Tim controls are R1 and P1. That means he wants to choose, he wants to choose R1 and P1 in such a way that's going to make his expected payoff as big as possible. So you do partial derivative with respect to R1. So we know that means you treat all the variables that are not R1 like they're constants. So P2 over here, that's not R1. So you treat P2 like it's a constant. So the partial derivative of this first term with respect to R1 is going to be minus P2. Here you have R1 times a bunch of things that are not R1. So you treat them like constants. <coughs> that partial derivative is going to be 1 minus R2 minus P2. Again, if you're a little bit unsure about this, um, review your calculus. I think I have a calculus review up on my courses. Um, I'll double check that and make, it up, make sure it's up there so everyone stays on board with the math. Probably the hardest part of these games with 3 by 3 is just keeping track of all the math and doing your calculus and algebra right. Now this term over here, 
doesn't have any R1s in it, so this is just a bunch of constants from our perspective. The derivative of a constant is always zero. All right, this term also doesn't have any R1s in it, so that's all constants from our point of view. So the noise is zero. How about this term? Uh, we do have an R1 in there. So this term, um, let's just write it out. It's a minus R2 if you expand it. It's a plus R2, R1, and a plus R2, P1. That's a constant, so that just goes away. There's no R1s in it. This one has an R1, and the derivative of that with respect to R1 is going to be R2. This last term here does not have any R1, so that's just a constant, it goes away. All right, very last term. So we have this over here. So we do have an R1 there, so we can't just dismiss it. This one can be rewritten as P2 minus P2 R1 minus P2 P1. So all I'm doing here is expanding this thing in the parentheses. So P2, that's not an R1, so that's a constant, it goes away. This has an R1, so we do care about it. The partial derivative of minus P2 R1 with respect to R1 is minus P2. This one doesn't have any R1s in it, so that's all constants, it goes away. So that's our partial derivative. We set that partial derivative equal to zero in order to maximize Timothy's payoff. Again, we got a lot of zeros here to just get rid of, so let me just rewrite that. Um, we can also gather like terms. So you have one and we have a minus R2 over here. We also have a plus R2 over there. So that means that these guys cancel out. Got a bunch of zeros, they all go away. I have a minus P2, another minus P2, and yet another minus p2, that's three of them. So minus three p2 equals zero. I guess we can do some more rearranging. One equals three p2. And that means that p2 is one third. How about that? Your childhood intuition, when I play paper, one third of the time was correct. We just proved it with a bunch of math and game theory. It's always nice when the math and intuition go along. It tells you you're definitely on the right track. Now, interestingly enough, if you're following along here, P2 is not Timothy's probability, rather P2 is Yusuf's probability. So I was doing the math for Timothy, but that gave me Yusuf's probability. That might seem odd at first. However, that also makes sense 
go back to what we learned earlier in the first couple of parts of this chapter. We start out with two by two games. So um, we develop what we call the opponent's indifference property. You want to pick your randomization in such a way that your opponent is indifferent between their strategies. Why was that? Well, if your opponent was not indifferent, they always play the best strategy every single time. And if they always do that every single time, there's no randomization. There's no randomization. That means no equilibrium. So Timothy's picking his probabilities to make Yusuf indifferent in the same way Yusuf picks his probabilities to make Timothy indifferent. It's just the same principle we had developed earlier. Now we're not done yet. This is one of the partial derivatives. Took the partial derivative for Tim with respect to R1. However, Timothy also controls P1, so I gotta take that partial derivative as well. So let's do that. So that means we treat all the variables that are not P1s like they are constants. There's no P1 in there. There's a P2, but P2 is not P1. So no P1s, that's a constant. Derivative of a constant is always zero. No P1s here either. So those are all constants from our point of view. Derivative of a constant is still zero. Oh, we find a P1. So P1 times an R2. So um, that partial derivative with respect to P1 is going to be R2. Here we've got a minus P1 times a bunch of things that are not P1. So a minus P1 times a bunch of constants. So we get the minus times all those constants. We do a P1 here in this term. So to figure out what's going on, we just expanded it. Fortunately, we already did that. So we get a minus R2. That's not P1, so that's a constant. That goes away. Plus R2, R1. Also, that's not a P1, so it's a constant, goes away. Plus R2 times P1. That does contain a P1, so that one is not going to vanish. Partial derivative of that with respect to P1 is R2. Okay, one last term. We have P2 times all that. Now, in that all that, there's a P1, so we can't just dismiss it. I went and expanded that over here. So I multiplied that P2 times all the stuff in the parentheses and wrote that over here. So I'm taking the derivative of this thing with respect to P1. That's not a P1, so that's a constant, goes away. Not a P1, so the constant goes away. There is a P1 there, a P1 times a minus P2, so that partial derivative is going to be minus P2. So we've got our partial derivative. We then set that equal to zero to maximize Timothy's payoff. Timothy's expected payoff, I should say. All right, so let's solve that. I got plus R2, and I have, um, that's going to be another plus R2. Let's just rewrite that and expand. So I have R2, the zeros go away, minus 1. Minus times a minus is a plus, so I have a plus R2. And 
minus times a minus is a plus, so I have plus P2. I have plus R2, and I have a minus P2. All that equals zero. The minus P2 cancels out with a plus P2. So I'm left with a minus one, and I have these three R2s over here. So I have three R2 minus one equals zero. Let's push that minus one over there. So I get three R2 equals one. Divide both sides by three to isolate the R2. And I find, big surprise, R2 is gonna be one third, which means that you play rock one third of the time, just like you intuited back when you were a kid. All right, so I've solved for R2, and I've also already solved for P2. You might say, well, we're not done yet. I still gotta solve for R1, still gotta solve for P1. Well, the good news is I have a shortcut. This game is symmetric. So if I found R2 and P2, if I found how Yusuf should play a game, and it's a symmetric game, then the same is true for Timothy. So I just cut my work in half right away. So if it's symmetric, then R1 is also going to be one third, and P1 is also going to be one third. So just to be formal, I'll write out our Nash equilibrium properly. So Tim plays R, it's prob one third, paper, probability one third, scissors, probability one third, And Yusuf will do the same. So for writing things out, you do want to write out this way so it's very clear what you're talking about. If you just circle R2 equals one third and call it your answer, it might not be obvious what R2 means and that could lose you some points. So just write out formally Take the extra minute to do so if you have to. Whoops. With um, prob one third. So that way it's clear you don't miss out on any points. It can be especially bad if students use like, like X for probability of R and Y for probability of scissors, then it's not obvious what X means and what Y means, so you'll confuse your grader, lose points. You write out formally like this, you're safe. So that's how you solve rock, paper, scissors. The same technique can be used for lots of other three by three games or games that are even more complicated than that. So be sure to tune in for our next episode and learn more about mixed strategies.